Mark chapter 14 is a long, long chapter. It's 72 verses. And um, I decided I wouldn't do a Bryce and do verse by verse. We haven't got time in the, t- the time that's left. However, when I first started to look at it, I was going to focus on the people that Jesus encountered in the chapter. It's really fascinating. And then I thought I was going to focus on the three rememberings, and I'm going to mention them, but not focus on them all. But as the time came close to tonight, I couldn't get my focus away from Mark 14, verses 3 to 9. Now, I'm usually long-winded, and I usually speak far too long, but the more and more I felt I shouldn't try and pad it out, I should just do what I felt God was saying. Um, So I am going to speak on the anointing of Jesus for the agonizing work he had ahead, because you know something I don't think there was anybody understood that more than Mary. But I would encourage you to spend time on the chapter in your own time. And um, I, I was talking to Bethany earlier because I don't know about you, but I certainly I love to hear how other people do their quiet times. And I think it's something that we could all benefit from each other. So maybe um, we'll have a session on that, or maybe we'll chat in our groups at some point and encourage each other. Um, But I would say, if you can, even if it takes you a month, just go through the chapter and see who Jesus spent time with in those last few days before he died. Let me pray. Father, I want to bring tonight before you. I want to thank you that you gave your the darling of heaven for us. He willingly came, and even when it was so hard for him, he willingly said, whatever you will as I'll do. So as we look tonight at your word, I pray that the Holy Spirit will speak through me, that the words that are mine will be forgotten, but the words that are from him will be remembered. And I pray, Father, that we will each get what you need to tell us tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. One of the things that um, I wanted to, I I thought of three things, um, but In her introduction to the lesson, which is lesson 13, even though it's Mark 14, um, Bethany tells us about a monument that stands in the grounds of Newstead Abbey, and it's in memory of a much-loved pet. And I was reading today, an early Queen Elizabeth had a pet cemetery in Sandringham, and she also had memorials for other dogs, and one of the interesting names was Sherry of Biteabout, which I thought was quite a name for a dog. But her pets were typically referred to as the faithful companion of the Queen. And I was thinking, what a wonderful description, and wouldn't it be lovely if we were named the faithful companion of the King of Kings? If you open one of my cupboards, (coughs) you'll find a shelf with mugs on it. It's my memory shelf. And here's a few. One says, I wish I was at Yorkshire Wildlife Park reminding me of the many happy days that I used to go there. It's one of my favourite places. Another is a picture of a mother and a daughter that Joy bought me. And a third is a tartan one, which reminds me of my favourite garden centre, cafe and gift shop near Loch Lomond. And we go there every single time we go up to Scotland. The final one I'll tell you about is a Tim Hortons mug, but not bought from Mansfield. It was one that Rob bought me one of the first times we went to Canada, and it's so precious because it reminds me of all the the lovely trips we've had. Um, Not necessarily as holidays, but just to spend time with family. The list goes on and on, and there's lots and lots of precious memories of people and places. Looking at Mark 14, there are three rememberings in the chapter. There's a woman remembered, verses 3 to 9, and we'll look more at that. There's a call to remember, verses 22 to 25. 
The actual words, this do in remembrance of me, are actually found in Luke 22 and 19, but Jesus is calling the disciples to remember him. And then there's a failure remembered and the tears that flowed afterwards, and that's verses 66 to 72. So maybe if you don't do it all, you could maybe look at these three. But let's read about the first one. <clears throat> and while he was at Bethany, in the house of Simon the leper, as he was reclining at table, a woman came with an alabaster flask of ointment of pure nard, very costly, and she broke the flask and poured it over his head. There were some who said to themselves indignantly, why, not, why was the anointment wasted like that? For this ointment could have been sold for more than 300 denarii and given to the poor. And they scolded her. But Jesus said, leave her alone. Why do you trouble her? She has done a beautiful thing to me. For you always have the poor with you. And whenever you want, you can do good for them. But you will not always have me. She has done what she could. She has anointed my body beforehand for burial. And truly I say to you, wherever the gospel is proclaimed in the whole world, what she has done will be told in memory of her. <clears throat> Neither Mark nor Matthew name the woman, but most people link the story to John 12 and assume that she is Mary, the sister of Lazarus and Martha. It doesn't mean that there's um, contradiction. Uh, I was speaking to Rob about just the difference between John and the, the other two. And he was saying, he pointed out something, that the gospel writers each had a different emphasis. And they were never really meant to mirror each other. And I think that's good for us to remember. I teach Sunday school. And um, when I'm speaking to the explorers that are about seven to 10 year olds, I'll use an emphasis relevant to their age. But when I go next door and speak to the second service ones, where the age group is maybe three up to about 10, then I'll use a different thing altogether. Still the same theme, but something different. And if I was teaching that passage to you tonight, I would, I would use different words. But it doesn't mean that the message is different. It doesn't mean that the emphasis is different. It's just that we use different languages or different emphasis, and that's what the um, Gospels were about. So following Bethany's lead and her introduction to the chapter, we're going to assume that the woman is indeed Mary. It wasn't the first time that Mary was in the line of fire for, by a complainer. In Luke 10, 38-42, her sister wanted her told off because she was sitting, sitting at Jesus' feet. But again, Jesus came to her defense. You see, Martha wasn't needing to get help to get things ready. They were all already ready. The Bible says she was distracted by much serving, putting too much emphasis on it. She could have sat down with Mary, but her emphasis and focus was on the wrong thing. And when she complained to Jesus, his response was, Martha, Martha, you are worried and troubled about many things, but one thing is needed, and Mary has chosen that good part, which will not be taken away from her. We know that Jesus and his disciples had been staying in Bethany, a village about two miles from Jerusalem, and they'd been staying there for the past few days, traveling back and forward to the temple in Jerusalem each day. And we also know that Jesus had been telling his disciples time and time again that he was going to die but they either didn't pay attention or they were putting their head in the sands, not wanting to accept what he was saying. Jesus was a frequent guest at Bethany, and it's assumed that he always stayed with Mary and Martha and Lazarus. And I just wonder how many times Mary took her place at Jesus' feet, quietly listening, taking it all in. Maybe like his own mother, did she keep all that he said in her heart and really thought about it? I wonder too, was she actually more ready to face Jesus' death than his disciples were? Mark 14 tells us that we were at the house of, they were at the house of Simon the leper, and this is a bit of an aside, but it really made me think. Simon must have been healed, or 
he wouldn't have been able to host a meal in the village. But despite his healing, that name stuck. I wonder, does a name or a description from your past still haunt you? You've been healed or delivered from that thing, but the description still causes you pain. Don't let a false description of the old life taint your new life. I had a friend in Edinburgh. Her husband had died very, very young and very suddenly, and she turned to alcohol to ease her pain. There were a group of young Christians in Edinburgh at that time who used to walk the streets in the early hours of the morning, looking to help those in trouble, quite similar to the street pastors today. They found Moira in the gutter and they helped her. She was an alcoholic and had been told that her liver was completely destroyed. She didn't have that long to live. But she gave her life to Jesus later on and she was miraculously healed. Um, And that was uh, borne out by what the doctor said at the hospital. She could have said in shame, I was an alcoholic. But actually, Moira started to say in joy, I was an alcoholic but Jesus has healed me. Maybe Simon wasn't haunted by this. Maybe he said it exactly like her. I was a leper, but I live to declare that Jesus totally healed me. Whatever your past holds, if you have given your life to Jesus and accepted that he has redeemed you, the Bible says you are a new creation, no more in condemnation. Don't let your past define you but let your freedom in Christ define you. So they were having a meal at Simon's house. In those days, cushions were set out in a horseshoe shape with the host at the top and the honoured guests on either side. I would just um, suggest that when you're looking at the Lord's Supper in the Bible and uh, various other times when they talk about the, the host and where the guests sit, keep that in mind. And the men lay on their sides on cushions with their head close to the low tables and their feet behind them. There's an interesting thing about this. Only the three reclined. Slaves and servants would not recline, but a bit like in Downton Abbey, they would stand ready and waiting for instructions given by the master of the house. So they were all reclining at the table and into this scene came Mary with an alabaster flask of ointment of pure nard. Mm. Now, when I was thinking about this, I wanted to put it in context for you. Nard was a plant found in northern India, and it was and pure nard was very, very expensive. The unhappy disciples did their sums and said it could be sold for more than three hundred denarii. One denarius was the equivalent of a day's wage for a labourer. Okay. So the payroll person in me couldn't resist this. The minimum wage in Britain at the minute is 11.44 an hour. Say they work 7.5 hours a day, that would come to 85.80. Five days a week, 429 pounds. So about 22,300 a year. If a person is self-employed and charges 110 pounds a day, works five days a week for 46 weeks, that would come to about 25,300. So is that realistic for a bottle of perfume? So I started to Google that as well. I can't tell you how much some of these perfumes were. I mean, it was just, this one wasn't that, that expensive. But one that I, I looked at, it cost 12,721 pounds, 89 per fluid ounce. Now, the alabaster flasks were normally between five and nine inches high, and a five-inch flask would hold about 2.77 fluid ounces. So, uh, 1,200, no, 12,721 pounds, that would be about 35,246. That's in dollars, so the equivalent in pounds is about 27,000 pounds, 27,500, actually. So it is actually possible that it could cost a year's wages. Indeed, in Mark chapter 6, verse 37, it says, the disciples said they would have needed 200 denarii to buy bread for 5,000 families. 
Well, if you cater for just 5,000 people at £5 a head, that comes to about £25,000. So the sums are all working out. And another thing about these flasks were they were made with very, very narrow necks so that only a tiny amount of perfume would come out at a time. But Mary didn't just bring an extremely expensive pure oil, but she broke the neck of that flask. She was holding nothing back. All of it was going on Jesus. Her action caused grumbling at the table. But just watch what happens here. In their complaint and scolding of her, they used a cause near to Jesus' heart, care for the poor. Their spoken reasoning for the scolding seemed so pious, and they were sure that Jesus would agree. But you know, he'd read Mary's heart, and he'd read their heart, and he was having none of it. We need to be very, very careful that our wrong motives are not excused by pious words. And we need to examine our hearts that when we speak against another, it is with the love and the heart of Jesus. Instead of Mary being told off, it was the indignant ones that Jesus told off. And he said to them, leave her alone. She has done what she could. She has anointed my body before hand for burial. And truly, I say to you, Wherever the gospel is proclaimed in the whole world, what she has done will be told in memory of her. A few of the commentaries I read said that Mary probably didn't know what she was doing. But, you know, I really wonder about that. Jesus didn't give the impression that she was unaware. As I said earlier, perhaps Mary had picked up on what was happening more than the disciples had because she was really listening when he taught and she was listening to what Jesus was saying. She had no prejudices. She didn't argue back. She just listened and thought about it. And when the time was ready, she was ready. There's a lesson here for us. Proverbs 3 verse 5 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and don't, don't rely on your own understanding. Before Mary acted, she sat and she listened. In a world driven by the needs to frantically do and perform, we need to learn to sit at the feet of Jesus, listening intently to what he has to say, giving him a chance to speak to us and really thinking about what he says. If we do that, Proverbs 3 and verse 6 says, in all your ways, submit to him. And when we do that, we'll get the promise, he will make your path straight. You know, whether you're a new Christian, a nearly new Christian, someone who's been a Christian for years, or someone who's been a Christian for many, many years, there is one thing that we all need to remember. We can only give out to others what God has given to us. Please, ladies, give him time. It's fine to be a doer, but only after you've been a listener. I'm not saying, though, that you need to go under condemnation in that and think, oh, I need to, I need to have an hour and I, I need to take the box that I've done, this and that and the other. Jesus knows your heart and he knows the season you're in. He knows the time you've got. But give him your first fruits. Just take it to him and just say, you know where I'm at, but I, want to tell, I just want some time with you and then just trust him. One of my friends, years ago, her husband wasn't a Christian, and um, he didn't really like her reading her Bible, but she used to go in the bath with her Bible. He didn't think anything of it. He just thought she was having a bath, but she was having an amazing quiet time with the Lord. So you can be um, creative, I think, sometimes. Well, Mary had listened, but you know, Mary was really a brave, brave woman. She went into that room, not caring what people thought, only intent on showing her devotion and love for Jesus. She'd listened to him and she did what she could, giving up perhaps a family heirloom, perhaps a dowry, perhaps an investment that it had taken her all her life to save for. Whatever it was, she gave it all, knowing the cost. 
There is a saying, live for the audience of one. That day, Mary lived for the audience of Jesus only. No one else mattered to her. Bethany also said in the introduction to lesson 13, <clears throat> as the aroma of her offering lingered in the room long after it was done, so would the story of Mary's anointing be told in memory of her. And I think this is, that's beautifully put. There was actually a saying in rabbinic literature, um, it was called Ecclesiastes Rabbah, and this is what it said. The fragrance of good oil is diffused from the bedroom to the dining hall, but a good name is diffused from one end of the world to the other. When our kids were young, we used to listen to a song which told the story of a man getting to heaven and being met by a line of people saying things like, because you taught in Sunday school, I am here. Because of your support to that missionary in finances and prayer, I am here. We could maybe add others. Because you never gave up on me, I'm here. Because you showed me the love of Jesus when nobody else did, when everybody else walked on the other side, I am here. Mary's act of devotion to Jesus, controversial as it was, is still talked about worldwide today. If you sit at the feet of Jesus and follow his paths, who knows what will make a difference in the life of another? If I said the names to you, names like Billy Graham, Chuck Smith, D.L. Moody, Bryce Hart, they'd be familiar to many of you. But what if I asked you who led them to the Lord or who first told them about Jesus? What if I asked you who prayed for them? Maybe it was somebody just like you. When I was young, I went with a missionary organisation called Operation Mobilisation, and that movement was started by three young men who went from America down to Mexico on mission, and it became a global missionary organisation. They still have ships that travel the world and can visit ports and destinations that are not always open to Christians. The leader of that organisation once brought what he called the true founder of it, when the ship visited Glasgow and he introduced us to her. She was a little old lady. The three boys were the bane of her life, caused trouble as they walked to school. But instead of complaining, she did what only she could do. She went to her knees and she prayed for them. All three became Christians and through them, many came to Christ. People don't know the name of that old lady, but she was the true founder. When she gets to heaven, I wonder if there will be a line waiting to say, because of you, I am here. So my final words to you tonight are, be bold, be brave, listen to his voice and his heart, and follow what he tells you to do, small or large. You are his child. You are his precious one, and he is waiting to spend time with you. No matter how weak or insignificant you feel, with Jesus by your side, directing your life, you are one mighty woman of God. Don't let the words of mankind hold you back from the potential you are in Jesus. Let's pray. Father, how precious is your word. How precious is the story of this woman who sat at your feet and loved you enough to give you everything that she had. Thank you for her example. And Father, as we go to our groups and as we go home, help us to be like her, spreading the beautiful perfume of your presence among those that we meet. In Jesus' name, amen.